you very much, uh, Nick and uh, for Trudy, for the kind invitation to speak. Can I ask, this is a great uh, number of people in the room, how many of you are uh, allied health professionals, nurses? Nurses? Great. Physiologists? Good. And medics, boring medics. Oh. Okay, so how many nurses of those nurses who put up their hands see patients in an independent clinic alone in the clinic room by themselves? And how many of you see patients alongside your consultant? Perfect, okay. And how many are, are patients? Any patients here? No, cool. So we'll talk about a guide to managing syncope. I just wanted to get a flavor, and for those of you who didn't see the, the hands up, it was at roughly a third each, nurses, um, uh, healthcare professionals, and medics. So um, you may have seen this already, but in the latest guidelines, the ESC guidelines, um, which I think is a very, very good document, and even if you uh, don't like to read guidelines normally, the pictures which are color coded and very easy to follow are some of the best that we've seen. And this is one such uh, flow chart. If you have a transient loss of consciousness, uh, you divide it into T lock due to head trauma or non traumatic T locks. And then you divide it into this roughly four segments syncope, epileptic seizures, psychogenic, and rarer causes. And by and large, we'll focus on syncope, but be aware that when you are seeing that patient in front of you who's undifferentiated, you have all these other things to think about. Syncope is defined as a transient loss of consciousness due to global cerebral hypoperfusion, and it's normally caused by a combination of reduced cardiac output and or reduced peripheral vascular resistance, so you're pooling blood in vessels that are expanding, either in the splanchnic bed or in the lower limbs. And when we think about syncope and the causes of syncope, it's very useful to try and, and this again is a very nice diagram from the same guidelines that I like so much. It's very useful to divide it into reflex syncope, cardiac, and orthostatic hypertension. So focusing on the cardiac, because this is the form of syncope that is associated with a mortality and a morbidity that's significant. We think when we see a patient um, in a non-selected, uh, first consult, we must always try and rule out cardiac syncope. And we think about the differentials, which includes tachycardia, bradycardia, so that's VT or SVT, complete heart block, structural, uh, typically aortic stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then the channelopathies, which you may or may not have a degree of experience in. And for the cardiac kind of syncope, the kind of investigations we would uh, suggest uh, to look at would be the ECG, echo, 24-hour tape, and other types of investigations, which I won't go into now. But here's one straightforward uh, investigation, which is a 12-lead ECG. And this is a 31-year-old woman with collapse. What is the diagnosis? So <clears throat> just give you five seconds to look at that. And maybe a show of hands, right? Posterior myocardial infarction. Let's see where we're playing. Sinus bradycardia. Long QT syndrome. Wonderful, we're playing, and Wolf Parkinson White. So in long QT, just a general rule of thumb is to look at the RR interval. And if you divide the RR interval into two, your QT interval should be shorter than your half RR interval. So just to illustrate that, this is the QT interval. This is the end of the T wave to the next R wave. So if the QT interval is greater than half of the RR interval, and you look at that ECG, then have a sense that this could be the long QT. Then go upstairs and look at the top left-hand corner of that ECG because it will give you the QT and it often gets it right, okay? So second one, 35-year-old man with fever and collapse. So the key history is fever. If you didn't even look at this ECG, you'd get the diagnosis right. But here we're going to look at Brugada syndrome, which is a channelopathy of the sodium channel. And in V1, this is a characteristic pattern. So this is the concave that's the elevation pattern in V1, V2, and this is a Brugada ECG. So we now move on to the other forms of syncope. Orthostatic hypotension uh, can be caused by blood loss, dehydration, orthostatic intolerance, which is defined as the inability to maintain blood pressure on standing, and you can subdivide this into early orthostatic intolerance. Can you detect this in your clinic? The answer is yes, you can. How? You stand a patient up how long? Three to five minutes. How do you do the blood pressure? As frequent as you can, right? 
So this is something that you should, we should all be able to detect in clinic because a patient who stands up and within three to five minutes starts to drop the blood pressure and feel symptomatic can have this diagnosis made without necessarily going on to have any other tests. Delayed orthostatic intolerance is much more difficult to diagnose. You can diagnose it on a history, but often <coughs> you need the patient to be standing for more prolonged periods. And in this situation, a tilt test can make the diagnosis, but also the clinical history. Here, we can think of other causes, primary and secondary autonomic failure syndromes, which I guess I don't see personally very much in my clinic. Some of you might, but these are the other differentials to think about the diagnosis here. And by and large, the most common, <clears throat> representing, I would say, 70 to 80% of patients who come to your clinic unselected with syncope will have reflex syncope. And this can be situational, and it does what it says on the tin. You have a situation that provokes a reflex, and then you have syncope. So such as cough, sneezing, micturition, postprandial syncope, exercise, laughter syncope. And then there, there's a very unique form of syncope called the carotid sinus syndrome, where if you press on somebody's carotid bulb, and you can sometimes do this in the clinic room, if you're feeling brave, no, just do it. <laughs> so, or we can do it in tilt table testing. And if you get a cardio inhibitory response reproducing syncope, then you've got cardio inhibitory carotid sinus syndrome. And oftentimes if you get that, uh, the indication is very, quite strong for a pacemaker because you can imagine somebody driving and turning over to the blind spot and abruptly losing consciousness without any ability to correct for that because it's a sudden onset bradycardia or asystole. Vasovagal syncope is the uh, form that is mediated by emotional stress, fear, pain, blood phobia, orthostatic stress, and we'll come on to spend some time talking about that in the tilt table description. So how do we diagnose syncope? I make no apologies to say that it's history, history, and history, and history, and history. Because really, <clears throat> the number of times patients can be sorted out at your clinic. So a lot of you will see the patients on the first sitting, and you will have that 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever time it is you have with them. If you take a proper history, history you don't have to send them for your cardiac clinic where they will invariably, the cardiology ST3 registrar will do a halter, will do an echo, might do an MRI, might do a Zio patch, might do a link or reveal device, when actually a lot of the diagnosis can come from these three things. Actually, five things. Because as part of the syncope assessment, I would urge that all of us look at an ECG. And even if we're not comfortable reading an ECG, just read what it says on the tin. Every ECG nowadays has a top left-hand corner, which should say in your young, fit, and healthy patient, normal sinus rhythm, you hope. Because when it says that, it probably gets it right most of the time. For those of you who are not comfortable reading ECGs, you can also read the QT interval. You can also read the PR interval. And if all that looks fairly normal, and your history is compelling, and you do a clinical examination to do what? What are you doing in the clinical examination? You're doing that lying and standing blood pressure. Do you remember I talked about three minutes to try and rule out that initial blood pressure drop? But you're also listening for what? For the murmur of, of aortic stenosis, right? That is a structural uh, abnormality with the aortic valve that impedes forward flow and can reduce blood pressure and uh, can cause syncope, especially during exertion. So these are the five things you can do, or actually it's three things. But with those three things, I want you to feel all empowered to give the patients a good chance and not going through this merry-go-round circus of a first fit clinic and then a cardiology clinic and then an EEG, MRI, uh, echocardiogram, Holter, and ECG, when actually you can have the diagnosis made in 85% of patients on the first presentation with a straightforward episode. So this is our kind of algorithm, initial evaluation. If we confirm syncope, I feel strongly that we can conclusively get a diagnosis, stop investigations, and more importantly, say something to the patient that's very meaningful so that the patient can then make the steps to correct whatever abnormality or lifestyle they uh, or understand their trigger factors. And this is one of my pet subjects. If we 
need to exclude at this stage from the clinical history the kind of odd things going on. Odd meaning could it be epilepsy and there are features in the history that suggest this. Could it be psychogenic pseudo-syncope or what I think Bob likes to term non-hemodynamically compromising syncope, which could be a better term because we don't like the word psychogenic. So, and this, this can be a very difficult um, diagnosis to make, often taking years and years of patients going around the houses before they get this diagnosis. And the most difficult bit is that it often does coexist with true vasovagal syncope, which was made, the diagnosis was made many moons ago and the symptoms then morph together. It becomes very difficult. And often I'm saying in my clinic letters, there are two types of symptom. Symptom type one with the three Ps and everything else, and symptom type two, which is a bit more atypical. And when I refer to a neurologist or a psychiatrist, I'm often writing in this way so that they know that I know that I think syncope, vasovagal, is one diagnosis I've catered for, counted for, but I'm suspicious of the second, right, which is this one. Because otherwise, I get back a letter from the psychiatrist or neurologist, why are you sending this patient to me? It's all vasovagal syncope, right? Because they take their own history. Anyway, we come down to risk stratification here. High-risk patients should be exclude cardiac syncope. Effectively, we should exclude low-risk patients are the more tricky ones in terms of the diagnostic algorithm. Recurrent syncope, we can go for, yes, if it's neurally mediated syncope, and then we go for tilt table testing, or if not, we go for ECGs. And the features suggesting epileptic seizures could be a bit in tongue, no memory of the, the abnormal behavior witnessed before, during, or after an event, prolonged limb jerking or confusion for a long time following recovery. These are features of epilepsy. Never trust the bystander who says the patient fitted. Ask the patient or ask the husband, the wife, the bystander to demonstrate to you exactly what happened. So often I will stand up and I'll say, tell me, don't, don't talk to me, show me. And if they have this kind of movements, this often occurs on tilt table testing when somebody's blood pressure is quite low. And they will obviously call this epilepsy or seizures, right? But that's very different from a tonic clonic convulsion that sometimes can also happen with syncope just to confuse matters. But if you're taking a history, don't write down that you think it's a seizure because you had a history from the bystander saying they thought it was a seizure. Describe what was shown in front of you. Even better, get them to record a video of the event to show you and to show the neurologist who this patient might be seeing because a video uh, tells a thousand words and actually often gives the, the diagnosis very clearly away to a neurologist or somebody who's seen this a lot. So clinical scenario 18, in fact, let me skip through this, skip through this. Investigation for syncope, I said history, ECG, clinical examination, and then the other things that we can consider down here. Tilt table testing is indicated to confirm a suspected diagnosis of syncope, but is not usually needed in patients who've had a single or rare syncopal episodes without injury. And here we all have learned the three Ps, right? We should be able to, in our history, unpick these three Ps. And so these patients should be given advice without the need for tilt or any other test. And it enables reproduction of a neurally, neurally mediated reflex. Now, here's an example of a tilt test that we do at Imperial, and we record using Phenopress, which is a beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure. And here we can see some calibration spikes. Ignore these things that occur here. But this is when the patient's lying for five minutes with a heart rate, respiration rate, and blood pressure. And after five minutes, we tilt the patient up to a 70-degree angle, and then we carry on for 20 minutes in what is called a passive phase tilt. You can imagine for a patient, this is boring as hell, right? Because you're gonna say, I'm gonna put you in a torture chamber with very dark room <clears throat> trying to simulate an underground carriage on a rush hour June uh, hot, stuffy environment. Um, and we hope that the syncope nurse doesn't faint. So we then normally see a heart rate rise to counter for this slight uh, pooling of blood that occurs in the lower limbs. And in this patient, they cope very well because there's no blood pressure fall. 
but there is a heart rate rise, and that's due to a sympathetic surge that is occurring, activated by the bare reflex. At 20 minutes, if nothing happens, we give sublingual GTN, and this is a vasodilator that dilates both the peripheral venous system, so your huge reservoirs, which are your lower limbs, that can take away something like 800 mils of blood, but also the splanchnic system in your gut, and that can take away another 500 mils. Now, considering we have five liters of blood normally circulating, that's taken away 20, 25% of your blood volume, and that creates a stress and a challenge and the inability to maintain adequate vasoconstriction, typically with a, slightly f a slight further increase in your heart rate as you have more adrenaline to vasoconstrict, to try and vasoconstrict, but here fail catastrophically, and here is when you drop. Now, therapy for syncope is, in my opinion, largely evidence-free. We always talk about lifestyle measures, and this includes 6 to 10 grams of salt. How much is 6 to 10 grams of salt? Is 1 to 2 teaspoons of salt. How do you advise your patients take it? Any way they can. Typically, I say, if you don't like the taste of salt, or typically I say, if you have a salt craving, succumb entirely to your salt craving. You're often very happy to hear this because there is all this stuff in the news about salt being bad. For those patients with a blood pressure that's low who have vasovagal syncope, salt is their friend. And you have to then dispel the fear that salt is bad. So if, if you're going to give salt, I would suggest that it's taken front-loaded in the, in the day. So in, at breakfast time and at lunch time, perhaps not so much uh, at dinner time because you need the maximum filling and the, um, the effect in the working day. You don't need it when you're sleeping at night. Two to three liters of fluid, I would also say front-loaded fluid, which means during breakfast. By the time they leave the house, try and have one liter. By the time it gets to lunchtime, 12 or 1 p.m., have the second liter. And by the time it gets to 5 p.m., have the third liter for the commute home. So it's very practical advice. And don't let them fall into the trap of still working their full day where they're standing at a cash till and saying, I can't drink. Why? Because I need to pee. But I come back and I do your three liters at dinner time, and they wake up all night. So that's not going to be helpful. You have to explain to them why the, logic, the logical sequence of events and why these strategies work. And to be honest, for the majority of the patients that come into my clinic, this sorts them out, not sorts them out, gives them enough understanding to change their, um, their syncope and their pre-syncope uh, uh, symptoms that they have an improved quality of life, they never need to come and see me again. We talk about physical counterpressure maneuvers, and essentially this is, uh, what I say to the patients is clenching your butt, and I often stand up in front of them, and I take a bottle like this, do you mind? And I take a bottle like this, <coughs> and um, I say, this is your vessel, right? We have two reservoirs in our lower limbs. This reservoirs, this is your vessel. It can be empty if you don't drink very much. And when you first stand up, blood pulls down into your lower limbs. And that pulls blood away from your heart. Your heart empties. As your heart empties, the stroke volume empties. Your barrel reflex here doesn't get stretched as much with each heartbeat. You then activate the barrel reflex and give yourself a lot of adrenaline, explaining why you might get anxious, dizzy, sweaty, hyperventilation, chest pain, all these symptoms can then be explained. And so you use this tool to explain how to help them as well. Because if you fill this up with water and you fill it up with salt, and when you stand up, the blood has nowhere else to go but bounce back up. And so your heart maintains that, thank you, your heart maintains that filling and never empties. And then you never have to activate that ad 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 adrenaline response and don't have all these consequences of those responses that are very otherwise difficult to explain. So the number of times patients, young, fit, and healthy patients come to my clinic having had a CT coronary angiogram for anomalous coronary arteries because of some chest pain declared during periods of palpitations, right? Chest pain, palpitations, young women. Typical vasovagal pre-syncopal symptoms. And you take a history and you understand the physiology that I've just described to you, you might put it in context. So 
I would say drugs, and I'm not going to focus on this. There's a long talk on this later on, so I'm just going to skip that, um, skip through this. Therapy for syncope, in terms of my personal experience, is to say that syncope is not fully cured, but patients often cope very well with it. You have to reassure them, acknowledge the severity of their illness, understand that they will have on and off days, and really, I truly mean this, that thing that I did for you, which was two minutes of physiology, please learn to do it with your patients, because these things really do make an impact. The patient's understanding of what's going on will educate and empower them to take the necessary steps, including clenching their butt. Now they understand why. Clenching their cups, they understand why. Drinking, front-loaded, salting, everything is understood. And here, we created a website, and, and this is where, just click next. If you go to whydoifaintingstopfainting.com, I created this gr graphic which really, um, can you press, why do I faint, please, Loris? And it really launches this schematic, which I think is really quite useful. If this is your blood pressure, and you say to the patient, this is your circulating volume, you have a prop, which is your bottle, click next. And when you first stand up, you can say blood take, is taken away from your heart and your head down to your lower limbs. Click next. As the heart empties, you activate the bare reflex, and you get more tachycardic, the blood pressure falls. With tachycardia, click toggle face, you sweat a bit, your brain is now empty, you're feeling unwell with the adrenaline surge, you get chest pain, click next. And as you continue standing and not do anything about it and not understand why, and even worse perhaps, you're sitting in a restaurant and you feel you need to get out of there. So you stand up to go to the toilet, right? Or to get out, that's when you collapse because when you stand up, click next, you then cause a rush of blood into the lower limbs. At this point, you become critically unwell, head is spinning, and you lose consciousness as your blood pressure drops. The heart is empty. Now, the Splanknik system can also be described using this, because if you have alcohol, which is a vasodilator, if you're in a warm environment, your skin vasodilates. So you can use this kind of figure to, to describe to the patients frequent small meals, maybe low in carbohydrates, so you reduce the effect of Splanknik vasodilatation, use this to illustrate why compression stockings can work. Imagine if you're just squeezing these legs from outside with grade two compression, which should be abdominal height or thigh length, or squeezing internally with your own muscles, so developing your lower limb tone, your gluteus, to try and get the blood back up and keeping in a warm, keeping in a cool environment. So this can be useful. Can we switch back to presentation, Loris? So, in fact, have I run out of time? Okay, so I'm gonna stop, sorry, sorry. Um, but I would say, in, in summary, education, empowerment of patients, and actually using the tools you have, and please feeling that you, you can do something about it. You don't have to refer to that, to that neurologist or to that cardiologist who probably wouldn't have time to see the patient take a history. You can take a history, and if you take a history properly and you use these diagrams or whatever illustrations you have and work out a, a a kind of spiel that you can give the patients, you can help everyone get better. Thank you. Questions?